This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Myself and one of our researchers were um, having dinner with an interviewee who happened to be from Indiana, and we got into this conversation about daylight savings time and uh, whether, in fact, it saved energy. And the, the impetus for the conversation was that I used to be at the University of Illinois. I used to always be missing my plane in, in Indianapolis because Indiana seemed to randomly choose what time, uh, time zone and whether it would be on daylight savings times or, or not. Now, Indiana wasn't quite random, but different counties had different rules. It was, it was difficult uh, to keep track of. So uh, what happened, though, in, 19, in 2005 is we had a natural experiment. These counties you see here in the bottom of this, this happens to be a piece of Indiana. These counties had different local policies on both time zones, central time, eastern time, and whether or not daylight savings time would be put into effect. In 2005, we changed that. We mandated all of Indiana behave the same with regard to daylight savings time and time zones. So it pre presents a natural experiment to see how those, those counties that changed were affected energy consumption wise. And what the researchers found was that daylight savings time, in fact, increased energy consumption in these counties. In the shoulder periods, light, lighting, Lighting was helped because uh, uh, well, lighting, 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 consumption for lighting was helped, but the load on air conditioning was significantly exacerbated by the introduction of daylight savings time, and the overall result was that this policy that was put in place to save energy actually had the opposite effect. Um, some other projects. Who ultimately bears the burden of a carbon tax? As, as we all know, the uh, Waxman-Markey bill is making its way through Congress, which will regulate carbon emissions in the U.S. either through a, through a cap-and-trade system, which is eff effectively the same as putting a price on carbon. One of the main issues on that is who ultimately pays that? Will it be uh, us consumers? Will it be firms that can't be hit any harder? Or who, who is the ultimate bearer of that? It's not an easy question to answer, but a fundamentally important one to, to move forward with increasing the price of energy, in essence. Uh, assessing the viability of new technology for CO2 sequestration from flue gas, another uh, critical part of any climate legislation is what to do with CO2 from flue gas. If you can't do something with the CO2 from flue gas, you have to use basically energy efficiency and conservation for all of your actions or fuel switching. The rebound effect, this is something we've known for a long time. Uh, it's simply, simply, it's easy to understand the context of a car. You make cars more fuel efficient. It's cheaper, to, cheaper per mile to drive them. People drive them more. So some of your, what you thought was going to be fuel savings disappears because of that. Happens throughout. Everybody has LED lights in their houses. They'll leave them on all the time instead of turning them off uh, more conscientiously. And then finally, evaluating the economic benefits of energy technology R&D. We're working with the California Energy Commission, discussing with the California Energy Commission ways in which their R&D efforts can be evaluated in terms of their effectiveness. Uh, these, this is my last slide. These are some other solution groups, solutions group efforts that are of a, of a different uh, nature uh, in order to implement solutions in the economics and policy area. We plan to pursue these five, six different areas, which I won't read off. You can read them yourselves because I am running out of time. 
Let me uh, <clears throat> close it at that point. I think that's my last slide. Yeah. And ask if there are any questions before I introduce the next speaker. Uh, Nick, Nick Hodson is a principal with McKinsey & Company based in San Francisco, uh, the San Francisco office. Nick has over 13 years of consulting experience concentrating on developing strategies and tactics for energy companies. I think we don't need to have me in stereo with two, speaker, two microphones. In recent years, Nick has been focusing on climate change issues, which I, I, I would remind everybody, energy, climate, almost the same word, flip sides of the same coin, because certainly almost all of the uh, greenhouse gases, a very large amount of them is energy com combustion. Try to do something about climate, it amounts to doing something about energy and vice versa. Uh, Nick has been focusing on climate change issues and, and worked on a variety of uh, clients on issues related to that and carbon abatement and the resulting business opportunities. Uh, in fact, I, I frequently get calls from people out of state wanting to know how they can actually set up a business to take advantage of, for instance, the cap and trade system in the state of California. As many of you know, McKinsey produced the widely discussed and not non-controversial carbon mitigation cost curves. Nick is a leader in McKinsey's clean tech practice and is closely involved in the development of McKinsey's broad-based knowledge investments in this area. Before entering consulting, he worked for Shell in the upstream, focused on competitor uh, acreage evaluation in the North Sea and for Mobil, now Exxon Mobil, uh, oil company limited, where he worked on supply, in supply and distribution and refinery scheduling and op, uh, optimization. Uh, Nick read uh, geology at Oxford and subsequently earned an MBA from INSEAD, one of the uh, leading European business schools. Uh, so, yeah, are we ready to go with uh, Nick? Or we still got some computer issues? All right. I think we're good. Thanks. Okay, is this working? This is left, right, isn't it? Um, good morning. Um, my name is Nick Hudson. As, as, uh, as you know now, I'm, a, I'm with McKinsey in San Francisco. Um, so a couple of bits of, uh, bits of background. I guess I'm a, I'm a geologist by, by original training. So I guess from when it comes to climate change, that means I, I kind of take the long view um, and I'm keenly awaiting our inevitable extinction. Um, uh, another thing you should know, because I, as, if I look a little bit less uh, relaxed than I usually do maybe is that what is about the worst thing that can happen to you when you get to your hotel the night before giving a presentation like this, especially if you haven't finished the presentation. Yeah, your computer crashes, right? So um, the good news was that it actually meant I had time to, you know, literally called my help desk, all that kind of stuff. They set some big old routine going on it. And I was able to come to the talk last night by William McDonough, so that was, that was actually a benefit. But the bad news is I didn't get to bed till about 2. But um, anyway, uh, hopefully uh, that won't show, won't show too much. I'll just kind of crash later in the morning, probably. A um, little bit of background on, on kind of McKinsey's position in all of this. Um, as, as I'm, you know, we'll, we'll look at a couple of slides from, from the uh, uh, report that was just referred to. Um, Important thing to understand about McKinsey is, you know, we're a consulting company, we're a commercial organization. We are not, um, we are not scientists, right? There are scientists, people with scientific backgrounds, but they're now consultants. You know, we don't have scientists on staff. Um, neither are we lobbyists, right? If you stop and think about it for a minute, um, as a firm of consultants serving, you know, large companies across the economy, you know, being lobbyists would be, put us in a tricky position, you know, because one minute it would be lobbying for something, another minute it would be lobbying for something else. And you know, if we start advocating policy, um, you know, actually advocating stuff in sort of public fora, that's, you know, could get us into all sorts of difficulties with, with you know, with, with, with our clients. Um, and indeed, I think that is one of the um, uh, sort of strengths of the of the um, analysis that that we've done and the, the 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 stuff that we've published is that we're not actually grinding any particular axe. And I've seen, um, you know, I've, I've spent some time in Washington and seen some of these, you know, been to various kind of, um, you know, committee 
meetings and stuff like that. And one of the things you notice is that, you know, there might be, um, uh, um, you know, a panel of a, a guy from the solar industry and a guy from the um, CHP industry and, a, and, 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 and one, of, one of our people. The, and I'm, I'm not blaming these people at all. It's absolutely what I would do if I was in that situation. But you, they can't help grind their ax, right, and sort of say, so that's why the solar industry needs, you know, support. Whereas we're kind of, if, if you know, right or wrong, we are agnostic, if you like, right? Um, that we don't uh, take a view, we don't even, in some sense, we don't even take a view institutionally on global warming, right? It's not that, that McKinsey's, McKinsey um, is on this sort of massive crusade, um, uh, you know, against climate change. It's that, you know, the balance of the evidence seems to say that something's going on. The balance of the evidence seems to say that governments around the world are going to start acting on this. And if you're a, um, if you're a business, you need to understand what that means, right? So we're not, you know, we're not a sort of, you know, firm of sort of advocates, if you like, or, 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 or zealots. What we are is a firm of business people who are trying to understand the business implications of all of this stuff. Um, so with that, with that said, um, you know, what are we going to talk about today? So um, first of all, we'll just run through a little case study of some client work I did recently that I, th I, think, I think you'll enjoy. And then we'll talk about um, carbon productivity, um, and we'll talk about what we mean by that. And then switch tax a little bit to talk about US energy demand and energy uh, productivity. And you know, as, as you know, I'm sure carbon productivity and energy productivity are almost the same thing, but not quite. Um, and so we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit. And then we'll talk about the, um, the sort of uh, business opportunities uh, and the, the size of the business opportunity and energy efficiency over the next, uh, over the next sort of 15 years or so. Um, so first thing I wanted to do is just share with you a, a, a client example. Um, most of the time, uh, you know, our work tends to sort of stay, you know, stay in the back room. We don't share it. We don't, we don't publish it. Uh, you know, it's, it's kind of confidential. But now and again, the client says, you know, we're totally happy if you, if you, if you share this work. And in this case, um, the client was very happy to um, share the work um, because the client is this lot. Um, this is the CEO. That's my wife. Um, that's me. I'm the, like, you know, lowly assistant to the CEO. Um, and we have four highly productive workers who, of course, do nothing but contribute to GDP um, and generally improve the efficiency of the running of the whole thing. And if you believe that, you believe anything. Um, the business has grown uh, pretty dramatically. We actually grew at a 20% CAGR for uh, six years, now mercifully flattened off. Um, and uh, the CEO is the only one who knows how much we spend on energy. And uh, the workers certainly are not internalizing the costs. And, um, uh, but they do have some concern from the education system about sort of Mother Earth and that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, what did we do? Well, a few years, a, a couple of years ago now, we installed an energy monitoring device in our kitchen. It monitors uh, the energy use in real time in our, in, in our house, um, electricity only. Um, this is actually output from that just quite recently, so in fact after we made some changes. But it's kind of nice, it's not something you see very often is what this actually looks like. Um, this is a little device, it, it, it um, works on a elect, um, magnetic induction on the, on the sort of main feeder cable coming into the house. Um, so you start off at midnight here, we're asleep. Um, you can see the uh, refrigerator cycling on and off, and uh, the, uh, forced, the, hand, the fan in a forced air heater cycling on and off. And then it looks like on this particular day, we got up about 6 o'clock, yeah, so, no, 6, 6.35 maybe. And the first thing that happens is we switch on about a 1500 watt heater in the bathroom, because it's blinking cold, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, and then there's a bunch of activity. The kids are up now. We're watching TV. Everyone's running around. Upstairs, breakfast, um, microwave, toaster, off to school, right? <laughs> Drops right down to nothing again. Okay, actually, very, not a lot happens during the, middle of the day, during the middle of the morning. Lunch, microwave, toaster again. Not a lot happens in the afternoon. Then the evening starts over here with, um, you know, it looks like a, a big pot of coffee. Microwave goes on big time for dinner. 
TV, da da da. And then, rather pleasingly, bathroom heater comes on again in the evening, just before we go to bed, and then you can see us sort of go to bed at the end, right? And this is this, um, you know, very. Unless you have one of these things, you absolutely have no idea what this looks like. For, it looks like for your house, and it becomes, a, you know, I mean, I guess I'm, in some sense I'm preaching to the converted. We'd all be obsessive compulsive about this, but I am. And when you look at this thing all the time, of how, what's your, um, you know, what's your usage running at? And if you, you know, if you suddenly see it's running high, you know, you can implement some um, corrective action, which otherwise means yelling, um, you know, saying, kids, you know. Um, one interesting thing is, even, this is after we had worked it pretty hard, and I'll come to what we did, but even then, we still got this base load of about 240 watts running throughout the day, which at this particular day, and this today, we didn't do laundry, which would make a big difference, but... Um, you know, that's still 40% plus of the total use, which is quite amazing, even after, you've, even after we've worked the, worked the problem pretty hard. Um, so we had this thing, we, we, you know, as soon as we got it, we started to, started to work the problem. Um, and what did we find? Well, the first thing is, we live in Northern California, we have a biggish house, we were in the top fourth, you know, tranche four of the PG&E um, scale. And at 39 cents a kilowatt hour, everything matters, right? That was the first kind of insight. Um, light bulbs, I had always sort of said, oh, come on, light bulbs just can't add up to anything, you know, compared to the dryer or whatever. But in a big house at 39 cents with 80 light bulbs, light bulbs really add up. Um, second garage refrigerator, uh, used a lot of power. The forced air heating was actually surprisingly electricity intensive. That's, you know, let's stand the gas. But I'd never realized that there's actually, you know, it's like a 500 watt fan in, in uh, the forced air heating. Um, standby power that gets a lot of people talk about a lot is it's, it's pretty blinking small, though to fix it is very cheap. You know, a power strip is like five bucks, right? You get it back in about six months. Um, but it's pretty, it is pretty, it's a pretty, it's pretty small sliver. Um, and then there was the well. We'll come to the well in a minute. Um, so we changed out, um, changed out our bulbs, we got rid of the fridge, uh, all the home entertainment systems went on to power strips. Uh, we basically lived in a colder house, we just turned the heating off and down. Um, and we added the standalone bathroom heater because really that was a bit inhumane, right? Um, and, that, if, and it actually it works nicely, it pays out because we were heating the whole, whole house to try and make the bathroom warm, and warm in the morning, right? Um, and then education to encourage attention to light switches, that's more yelling. Um, and then there was the well, right? So this is what we got. Um, we actually sent off, we, pg and &E are wonderful, we you know, said, could you send us all of our bills since we moved into the house? So this is what we have. Um, so the average up through about September 2007 was running about 24.9 kilowatt hours per day. Um, we're very benign climate, right? We don't have air conditioning or anything. Um, we installed the thing in January um, 2008, and that's our performance since then. So but versus that 24.9, we've seen a 31% drop just like that, right? And at a very conservative 25 cents a kilowatt hour, that's $700 a year. The device cost about 150 okay? Now, the well. The well, we have a well in the back, in the back garden um, that uh, supplies water for irrigation. It has a 750 watt pump in it, and a pump, you know, motor driving a pump. And um, something was wrong with it, and when we first got this device, we could not get load to go below about a kilowatt. And we went round and round and started flicking switches on the, on the fuse box, basically, and we discovered that the well, the sort of, pressure switch or whatever had gone wrong in the well, and the well was pumping against the head 750 watts 24-7, right? 39 cents a kilowatt hour. That little bump here, that's, that, that's the well. It actually, if you do the math, it actually works out. That was $400 all on its own, right? So the thing paid for itself basically in two weeks. Um, uh, so, it, you know, just sort of, I've been asked at presentations like this, well, do you have CFL bulbs? And the answer is yes. And uh, we, you know, we saved a, we've saved a, a ton of energy and a, and a, and a, and a ton of um, uh, uh, power. And one of the funny things is when I talk about this with utilities, 
Utilities love this story because it also, there was also a, a little bit of a sort of local community built up around these things. There were several of us in my neighborhood who got these devices and actually started sort of talking about it in the pub, if you see what I mean, saying, you know, what are you at, what are you at? And the utilities love this because this is a lot of the sort of, uh, of, the, of the, you know, discussion around um, energy devices and, and uh, you know, get, having it all on the internet and Google and Google are in, playing in this area and being and all of that kind of internal competition. And it really did happen. Um, and we still talk about it, you know, two years later, we still, we're still um, pretty obsessive about it. So anyway, that's just um, a, a little client example. Uh, let's talk, switch to um, carbon productivity. So a little bit of little bit of science, and as I say, we're not we're not the scientists around here, but it just helps to um, uh, uh, sort of set the target. So if we believe, if we if we take the scientists at their word, IPCC, and I, and I do, I have no reason to doubt them. Um, the we need to get down to this kind of 450 ppm atmospheric atmospheric CO2 um, pathway by about 2050 if we're going to stay. You know, it's not even safe, as I'm sure you all know. You know, you're looking at a couple of degrees temperature rise. Um, you know, pretty bad, but we don't want to be up there in the 550 ppm pathway. To get onto the 450 or a little bit below, we need to get global emissions down to about 20 gigatons. This is gigatons here against time by about 2050. Okay, so 20 gigatons, if you like, is a target for 2050. So we then sort of just basically ran some math. Around, around that. Um, so the first thing is, over the next, uh, what is that, 42 years or something, we need to bring um, emissions down from their current 55 down to about 20, okay? That's a decrease of 2.4% per year. Um, at the same time, it is reasonable to expect that we'd like the economy, global economy, to continue growing. It's no, you know, as we've all just discovered, it's no fun when the economy doesn't grow, right? Um, so 3.1% per year growth in the economy. Reasonable number for sort of long-run global, global GDP growth. Problem is that you've got to do that and that at the same time, which means to take your carbon productivity, by which I mean dollars of GDP per ton of carbon dioxide emitted, we've got to take it from its current low level of $740 all the way up to $7,300, okay? So we've got to increase that carbon productivity by 10x in 42 years. Carbon productivity does increase, sort of left to its own devices as, economy, as, the, as economies grow, it does increase sort of slowly, um, but not, as you'll see in a minute, not necessarily systematically. So this is, um, wealth on the horizontal in, in GDP per capita against carbon productivity on the vertical, and each line is a, is a country, basically, or a, in, we actually have California on here as well into yellow, and with a t sort of plotted as a time series. So you, it sort of drifts up through time. Sometimes it, it'll, it'll cut back again. It'll typically cut back again a little bit in a recession, um, which is why you see some of these kind of wiggles. Um, the US today, just around, this is 2003 number, so it's about 1,000. Um, California, much higher than the US as a whole, as I'm sure you're aware, mostly um, uh, power mix, much, much cleaner power here, uh, industry mix, and, uh, and quite a lot of activity on, on efficiency. Um, India is quite an interesting one. It's come down, it actually comes down, if, and I think that's because the numbers are a little bit screwy when you're at very, very, very low levels of GDP, because very, very low levels of GDP is kind of subsistence farming, and it doesn't really use any energy at all, right? So you get this rather weird sort of thing up there, and, if you, and I suspect if you, if you did this analysis and kind of subtracted out, I don't know, the first couple of thousands of thousand dollars of GDP per capita, call that sort of very low levels of, of GDP, um, you know, it would probably kind of correct in some way that if the first couple of thousand bucks doesn't really count in some sense. Um, but it does drift up, drift up through time. Um, the improvement we need, though, is pretty dramatic. We've seen improvements in productivity like this in the past. Um, the Industrial Revolution um, in the United States between 1830 and 1955 um, 
growth in labor productivity in the United States was about 10x, right? Um, but that took 130, 125 years, grew at about 1.8% per year, growth in, growth in labor productivity. We need a 10x increase. Trouble is, we gotta do it in 42 years. So it's, you know, this, it's been done, but it's never been done this fast, right? Additionally, this is, you know, this is what it means to be in a carbon you know, a truly carbon constrained world, right? If GDP grows faster than 3.1%, you have to increase carbon productivity faster because you can't just increase emissions, right? So this is a kind of ready reckoner. At 3.1% GDP growth, this is a GDP growth forecast along the horizontal against the required um, products, uh, carbon productivity in 2050 um, on the vertical. So at 3.1% growth, we need to get to 7,400 tons on the horizontal, right? But if GDP grows faster, which, you know, in any normal world would be pleased about, right? Um, you know, say it grew at 4.5%, you know, you've got, to, you've got to double it again to like 14,000 tons, right? So, you know, a real sort of conundrum. And, you know, by the way, if, you don't, if we don't improve um, carbon productivity, we don't do anything about it, and we stayed at our sort of 750 tons, GDP would actually have to shrink by about 1.8% a year for us to meet that emission target. You know, imagine what that would feel like, right? 42 years of negative 1.8% growth would not be any fun, right? I mean, we'd all be dry, you know, we would have less, I mean, we'd literally have less cars, smaller houses, you know, less fridges, <laughs> you know, we'd be all poor, poor as anything, right? Um, so, you know, this is a very unpalatable prospect, right? If you're in a truly carbon constrained world, you really have to increase productivity has to come with increase, increased economic growth has to come with increased productivity and carbon. Um, what would it feel like at today's level of carbon productivity to live on that, if we had to try and live on that 20, 20 gigatons, right? So in 20, 20 gigatons, is 2.2 um, tons in, at, a, at a rough population in 2050 of 9 billion people would be 2.2 tons per year each, okay? That would be your budget. You get 2.2 tons of carbon dioxide emission, which is about six kilograms a day, okay? What do you get for six kilograms a day? Well, you could drive for about 30 kilometers and then stop. Um, you could stay home and sit in your air conditioning, but don't watch the TV. Um, you could shop, buy a couple of t-shirts perhaps, but you walk to the shop. Um, or you could eat a little bit, right? But with no t-shirt, you walk to the restaurant and um, your house was hot. You see what I mean? It's really, really, it's, it, you, it just sort of brings it into focus what, you can, what you'd have to do, right? You, we've got to get to it. We have to increase. If we, if we value our lifestyle, we have to increase um, you know, increases productivity very, very dramatically. Um, it is not, you know, it does, in, carbon productivity does increase with economic growth in sort of general, but there's not a lot of R squared in that, right? <laughs> This is, uh, this is prosperity along, along here against carbon productivity on the vertical. Um, all the dots are various countries, right? You have up in the top left, you have the kind of subsistent agriculture situation I was talking about. Um, St. Kitts and Nevis is the most productive economy in the world. You know, that made a difference. Um, and I think Nevis basically has a Ritz-Carlton and that's it, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's about the size of a postage stamp. Um, I'm not sure about St. Kitts, but Nevis, I know, is, is a one hotel island. Um, I've never been there, but I read about it. Um, but you can't, what you can't say is that, all, is that all developed countries are more productive, right? So the United States is here, and these, and these numbers are at about $1,500. Um, you know, we're obviously, we're obviously very, very rich, but our, you know, our pro carbon productivity is not, you know, it looks about the same as Pakistan, right? You know, there's something to be proud of, right? Um, obviously, up in, there are these countries up in the top right where, where they've you know, got very clean power mixes and they've worked it a lot. You know, Sweden and Switzerland, um, obviously lots and lots of hydro and, and pretty um, uh, efficient economies too, energy efficient economies. 
But you know, this is this is pretty embarrassing, right? Where where we are on this on this uh, on this chart. I am British, but I'm, I am a citizen actually, so I feel some sense of ownership. <laughs> um, um, but you can't, you know, what you can't do is just sort of say, don't worry, progress will take care of it. You know, we have to intervene. Um, so that sort of leads us to, you know, energy efficiency. But if we're going to get there, that, and, and I've been talking up until now about a 2050 target, um, this is these, these um, abatement curves that you've probably all seen, but I will, for those that haven't, I will run over what they mean. These are done for 2030, so these are emissions, emissions abatement opportunities up to 2030, and that would be sort of on the path, but you've got to kind of go beyond that as well. Um, so this, we had, this is the um, McKinsey uh, carbon abatement curve global version 2.0, as we call it. So we did a version, we did a first version, I think now three years ago, something like that. Um, and then we've done a US version, which I'll show you in a second. We've just redone the, um, the, the, the global one. The message, however, remains the same. So we just quickly kind of clear the page. You've got cumulative emission potential, uh, abatement potential in, in gigatons of carbon dioxide along the horizontal, cost per ton of abatement up the vertical, Anything that is below the line, any bar that is below the line is what we call a negative cost opportunity, i.e. it has a positive NPV at, I think it's a 7% discount rate. Um, and v v a large majority, nearly all of the things that are below the line are efficiency. Okay, there's a few things that aren't. You know, clinker substitution by fly ash, for instance. Um, and a few little bits and pieces, but most of those things are efficiency. In the middle area, there's a lot of things there that you could vaguely call sort of offsets. It's sort of land use type stuff, and you could throw biofuels in there too. And then as you move to the right, that's kind of technology, right? So solar and wind and CCS and all of that is on, is on, is, is on, to, is on the right. But efficiency, you just say, you know, efficiency is roughly a third of the potential, and it is basically all in the money. Right, it's all good good stuff that we should do. Um, you know, we should do. Uh, you know, immediately. And if and if this if these curves have done anything, I think they have. They've you know focused the mind of you know the policymakers, etc., on on that on that left hand side. You know, I'll, I'll be honest. You know, my voice quivers a little bit over here. Right where we're projecting learning curves and God knows what else, right, to try and come up with a cost for CCS, right? You know, it gets a little bit, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's probably somewhere in that, in that, re, in that area in terms of cost. But I'm not going to stand here and tell you that, you know, coal CCS new build is exactly that, right? It's just, it's expensive and it, it'll be a big opportunity, um, but, it, you know, but, it, but it's an expensive opportunity. Um, so that's the, that's the world. The U.S. is a very, very similar story. Um, if we had our time again, there are a few things we might do differently um, if we updated this. But the basic story is the same, that over here on the left-hand side is a whole bunch of efficiency stuff. We've got um, commercial electronics, residential electronics. Um, that third bar there, right in the middle where it says 0.2, that's CFL light bulbs in houses. Um, commercial lighting is the one next to it, fuel economy in cars, da, 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 et cetera, right? One of the, you know, I guess it's sort of, maybe, maybe if, I don't know, I, I wouldn't even begin to take credit, if you see what I mean, that, that we shouldn't take, we're not taking credit that anything we've done here has actually sort of impacted, you know, what Obama is thinking about or whatever. But one of the annoying things about it is, is that the damn politicians keep shifting the baseline, right? So, you know, and so, you know, and, you know, they did it the day before yesterday, right? And so, if you're, what, if you're paying close attention, you'll actually find some of the numbers about fuel economy are a little bit loosey-goosey because the answer is we haven't worked through it all yet, right? Um, but, you know, this, this was against a business as usual case circa 18 months ago or maybe 24 months ago when you know, the 2007 energy bill hadn't, hadn't been passed yet, 
et cetera. You know, we didn't know who was going to be who was going to be president, et cetera. And so some of this would move around if you do it as you know the business as usual forecast would now come down, and some of these opportunities would disappear. But you know, that it's sort of angels on the head of a pin, right? So the big message though is huge amount of opportunity on efficiency on the left hand side there. Um, so U.S. energy demand, or just starting off global, global got to introduce, reduce emissions by, it's going to be by about three quarters is what it turns out to be. The forecast emissions in 2050 will be about 85 gigatons. We need to bring that down to, uh, to about 20, as I've said. So what can you do about it? Well, the first thing you can do about it is a big-ass recession helps. Um, so... so um, and there's, frankly, a huge amount of uncertainty right now of trying to forecast exactly what energy demand is going to be in, 20, in 2020, let alone 2050, is, uh, is a pretty tough job um, because the economy is wobbling around all over the place. Um, and it's, you know, we've, we've, we've you know, as a, only a consultant could, we've modeled this from the bottom up, you know, industry by industry, sector by sector, technology by technology, to predict energy use by, according to these... Um, economic scenarios of, of GDP outlook. These are basically, diff, these are sort of they're dimensionalized on the severity of the recession and the, uh, and the, and the um, uh, liquidity in the credit markets. And if, you, if you're in a situation where the, we have a bad recession and the credit markets don't reopen, then the recession ends up to be really long and bad, right? Which is this bottom left one. You know, if, if the recession is mild and the credit markets reopen quickly, we get this kind of little sh short dip. Um, the s s CEOs we interview and, you know, we, we, every, time we, every time we have a discussion with, with senior um, executives on this stuff, we sort of say, so what do you think? And the scores on the doors right now are that 44% of our senior executives are saying they think it's going to look like the top left, and 34% are saying it's going to look like the bottom right. Um, and there's a couple of, you know, some real pessimists and some optimists. Um, these, two, these two across the diagonal there are quite similar, fortunately. So from, in terms of forecasting, it, it sort of, it, it, it's, it makes it a little bit easier. But it makes a big, big difference, as you'll see. So if you, if you model this, as I say, this is done in an exorbitant amount of detail. Um, but we've modeled this from the bottom up. Um, total, uh, we're now in uh, actual energy use, so we're in quadrillion BTUs. A quadrillion has 15 zeros, I think. It's a, billion, a billion is nine, a trillion is 12. Yeah, 15. Um, 15 zeros of BTUs. So this is energy demand. But you can see it makes a very big difference. You know, we're at 91 uh, QBTU, this is US, in uh, 2006. You know, we don't, if, if we go through one of these, one of these, those two, two diagonal ones, they're the ones in the middle, um, you know, we don't get back to that level of energy use until, you know, 2018 or something, because there's some efficiency, there's some efficiency happening as well, plus the economy got slowed down. Um, and it, it just makes a colossal difference of, of where you come out on this, on this stuff. So it's, again, it's the point of economic growth, you know, really matters. Um, having said that, the US, the US, US energy, of energy pro so we're now in energy productivity, almost the same thing, but not quite, as I said. This is billions of dollars of GDP per QBTU of energy. Um, Western Europe today in 2006, here in the middle, is at about uh, 142 billion per QBTU. We're at 124. We've been increasing gradually. Um, you know, it looks like our, our forecast is that we'll get to 155, kind of in some sense on current course, right? So things that we know about, the, the, the sort of gradual improvement we see, generally speaking, but that doesn't mean capturing all of those left-hand side opportunities at all, right? It sort of means making incremental progress against them. Um, however, if you, if you were to go after those... Um, those uh, uh, left-hand side opportunities in a systematic way. What we've then done is we took all those opportunities, we turned them back into energy rather than CO2, um, and we uh, uh, you know, modeled them across the economy. 2006 energy demand was 91 QBTU. 
if we go after those opportunities beyond business as usual, um, we could actually bring energy demand down to 79 QBTUs. So we could actually see energy demand in the United States decline, which is never done in history, except in a big recession. Um, so we're, you know, we're assuming that growth um, resumes. We're actually, we're actually assuming this one we call battered here, this one with the, the, one, the sort of second one down from the top. That's the assumption on, uh, on economic growth. Um, there's a bunch of opportunity in residential, a bunch of opportunity in, uh, you know, that's lighting and, and air conditioning and, and insulation and all the, you know, all the good stuff. A um, bunch of opportunity in commercial, um, same kind of thing, HVAC systems, stuff like that. Transportation, just bear, this is, this is what I mean about a little bit wobbly right around here, because what we've now done is we've, is we've baked the, a sort of 35 average fuel economy across the fleet. We've baked that in now. Um, and so it sort of now shows as a zero. Two days ago it didn't, it was a big, it was a big number, <laughs> right? Um, uh, so transportation, it's a, it's a, it's a big impact, but it's, its impact is in, is in the fact that uh, the, the demand only grows by five. You see what I mean? That we've taken it out and it's in the growth side now rather than in the savings side. Um, and then there's one down the bottom, transformation. That, what that refers to is what we call transformation industries, which are transforming one form of energy into another form of energy. So this is um, energy savings in, in refining and, and, and uh, exploration and production and stuff like that, right? There's actually a lot of flaring and stuff like that that can be, that can be gone after there. But you could actually see, if, you know, if we go after this aggressively, in the next 12 years, we can get you know, a very substantial um, reduction in energy demand, um, which would be you know, a spectacular thing to see. And, and the opportunity is, is very real. And all of this is economically attractive. This isn't doing anything that is, um, that is uh, uh, uneconomic. <clears throat> so as an example, going back to the transportation, the reason that's zero is not that there is no further potential, but that you know, what our economics say is that if, if you at 35 MPG, and I'm generalizing across the fleet, right? At 35 MPG, at $75 a barrel crude, which is what the uh, assumption was for crude, um, it's, you're at about the economic level. If you, you wouldn't want to go any further than that at $75. You might legislate that, but it will cost, the, cost you money. It's, it's, it's not a positive NPV investment to invest beyond 35 MPG at $75 crude and our United States tax, fuel tax environment. That would look different in, the, in, in, in Europe, right? It's literally the NPV of the fuel savings. Now, we know that we can do things like this, and I'm sure um, many of you have seen at least one version of this, of this chart. This is the famous um, California versus the rest of the, rest of the US per capita electricity consumption. Um, it's been shown lots of different ways, but this is the actual sort of raw data, if you like, that California, ele electricity consumption in California has been dead flat per capita. Doesn't mean electricity consumption in California hasn't grown, it's grown a lot, but it's only grown with, with population. Um, and Electricity and consumption in the U.S. has grown quite steadily per capita, um, and this is, you know, very good evidence that you can kind of intervene and make a, you know, and, and, and make a difference, right? Um, not all of it is intervention; some of it's kind of structural. So. There are about half of the difference between today's 7.1 megawatt hours per capita and the United States average at 12.2. About half of the difference is, is structural factors. So it's, it's weather, it's industry mix, um, you know, stuff like, stuff like that. It's household size. You know, one of the things that actually helped California is that I believe I'm right in saying that the average household size in California has actually grown a little bit in the last 30 years, whereas in the rest of the country it's fallen. And you know there are economies of scale, right? You know, that you only need to you know you cram more people in the house. They don't use they don't use they don't use more energy. They you know they still have a fridge. They still heat the house. Um, so there's a series of factors there. But nevertheless, the other half is entirely is is essentially entirely down to um, to intervention. It's, it's building codes, as we all know. We've got very good, um, much more stringent building codes. 
and have had, or most of the more important, we've had them for much longer. Um, appliance standards, famous case study, right? Um, and energy efficiency efforts, both by the, um, by the utilities, you know, all the various schemes utilities have that in, in California. Um, you know, I, 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 I serve utilities out here and, and you know, I swear you almost have to sort of take your, you know, take, take one hat off and put another on, right, when you go into a utility, because the economics are also, you know, hang on, you, you don't want to sell anymore? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, and, and also in there, quite frankly, is, is price, right? That at 39 cents, everything matters, right? And so people work, you know, people do, people are much more, you know, just care more about whether they have a fridge in their, gar in their garage or whatever in California than they do in the rest of the country. You know, if in, you're in Texas and it's eight cents a kilowatt hour, it's hard to care, right? Um, but nevertheless, very, you know, with the right um, policies and the right incentives, you can, make a, you can make a really significant difference, and the California example is, is a very, very good one. So um, what does this kind of mean sort of for, the, for opportunities? So the energy efficiency market, you know, what is that? A little bit hard to get your, get your, get your hands around. It's a, if you, if you sort of say, all right, let's think about the energy efficiency market. It could be everything, one way of defining it would be everything you ever spend that gets spent on anything that consumes energy. If you think about it, that's a good chunk of the economy, right? It's like probably most of it. And it, so it would be this giant market of like $2.7 trillion, right? Um, that's not, you know, that's not that helpful, right? There's another market, another way you could define the market at the second, the second row here, which is revenues from sort of energy efficient products, right? So the easy way to think about this is, is actually to come down this other side, so by analogy. So if you looked at the room air conditioner market, the total market for room air conditioners in the United States was $1.6 billion in 2005. Energy star room air conditioners, so the efficient ones, was $610 million, right? But that's really too big because an Energy Star appliance is only a little bit more, is, is just a bit more expensive than the, you know, the regular one, right? So the energy efficiency market is really that increment, right? Which in room air conditioners is about $122 million, right? So if you, if you come down that in 2004, which was a, dear, a year when, when the ACEEE gave us a, a, good, uh, a, good, um, a good read, you know, we estimated this market to be about $35 billion. We then think that it's, you know, there's been a lot of attention on this. We've had you know, a huge oil price spike, et cetera. This market has, has grown quite, you know, quite a bit quicker than GDP. So we think it's probably grown by about 10% a year. So that the piece we were just looking at is now worth about $52 billion, okay? Now there's another piece though that is effectively kind of energy services revenues. It's the people who design the solutions, right? The design of the office blocks, new air conditioning unit, or whatever. Um, you know, ESCOs are in there. And then there's another piece which is actually pretty significant that is in some sense, which, which was, would never be captured by somebody who was trying to, you know, measure the sales of room air conditioners, which is actually just, frankly, sort of fairly low-grade labor doing installations, right? Um, and so if you add those up together, the 52, the 14, and the 23, you get about $90 billion of, of market today. Um, that will kind of go clanking on with, you know, with GDP. It'll get a little bit bigger each year in, in the base case. The other point, this, the, the bottom of the chart just shows, you know, so you spent $90 billion. You got probably $238 billion in present value in savings. Right, so it's enormously positive. You know, this is great money to spend. Right, it's enormously positive um, uh, uh, IRR on that investment. It's about 30% in total. Um, however, if you then look at the um, that left-hand side of the curve and say, let's get that in, let's get that in, uh, let's get that in 12 years, that would take an investment of something like 40 billion dollars per year. To, to capture all of that. And so you had a $90 billion market. Now you've got, you know, to add a, basically a $40 billion piece on top, and that's just in kind of the equipment, right? So in total, we think that you'd have, you know, 
the, you get, you take that 40, you put it on the first two slices, capital costs and the services, add more installation, right? And you get to a market of about $150 billion a year. So this market will, will kind of, gr if we go after that, if we, get, if we can get the policies in place to go after that, um, uh, that, 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 that opportunity, the market gets really very big indeed. So about $150 billion a year between now and 2020. And it's kind of, you know, every day that we don't, uh, we don't go after it, that sort of, it sort of moves out, right? Uh, the IRR drops a little bit, but not much. It's still very, very attractive investments. Um, you know, it's about 22% IRR on those, on those additional things. That market divides into a series of segments. Um, there's a series of stuff in building and technology. Uh, uh, building technology is some very interesting work going on on sort of efficient windows and that kind of stuff, but there's also a lot of relatively, you know, there's sort of lagging, you know, stuff like that, pretty low-tech stuff. And this, of course, is one of the reasons why the AWRA is focused on some of this, is it's, it's there's a, you know, available, available technology, in, insulation, you know, good manual labor, using construction workers who don't have anything else to do right now. It's a very, it was a very attractive area for the AWRA to go after. Um, electrical devices, light bulbs, um, appliances, et cetera. The whole area of transportation. Uh, transparency, um, creating products. So that's, the, that's like the little display product that I was talking about at the beginning. <coughs> sort of more customized solutions. Um, uh, city lighting systems, HVAC systems for buildings. The whole sort of ESCO market um, of, of energy services, and then a big area, a big market of financing all of this stuff. And there's, uh, you know, it's, again, part of part of the AWRA is to try and uh, try and sort of unplug that. But there are a lot of banks, you know, sort of starting to pop up that specialize in trying to finance these things. Um, so, in closing, you know, what do we need to do to sort of make it happen. Why doesn't this, you know, one of the constant questions we're asked is why, do, if it's such a good idea, why hasn't it happened? Well, firstly, um, you know, and these are the sort of barriers we need to remove through, through uh, policy and education. Um, investor behavior. Investors, and by which I mean both companies and consumers, um, seem to apply high implicit discount, uh, uh, implicit discount rates to their investments in energy efficiency. I've seen this, I, I did some work at a supermarket recently, huge opportunity to save energy, and for some reason or other, they, they apply a two-year payback requirement to an to a energy efficiency investment, where, you know, which equates to whatever it does in IRR, but it's you know, very high. Um, whereas on, the, on, the, you know, on a store upgrade or something, it's much, much lower hurdle rate. And that's really because I think it's two things. One is it's kind of just not, not as cool and sexy for, the, you know, for, the, for, the, for a retailer. Um, it's also, it can be alarmingly hard to prove, you know, there's the, 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 this particular company, the executives um, were bonused on, uh, at least partly on the performance of investments they made. And so if they, if they said that the sales of the store would increase by X, and they did, they got a little kicker on their bonus. Very, very hard for an energy efficiency investment to sort of, to demonstrate clearly what happened. You know, if, it's, if you then get a particularly hot summer, you invest in the HVAC or whatever, you get a hot summer, you end up burning more electricity than you did last year. And to sort of, you know, to sort of prove that gets, you know, gets, gets, gets pretty hard. So um, a sort of investor behavior, agency issues, I'm sure you've, you know, this is the landlord-tenant problem, that the landlord is responsible for investing in the, in the building but is maybe not paying the utility bill. And, and uh, it's, similarly, the, uh, you know, the builder, uh, it just has very little incentive to put in all the extra insulation because it's very hard to get that back in the value of a house. And lots of, you know, there are, there are policies popping up around the place to try and make that transparent and to try and show what an energy bill is. Um, uh, the time of ownership occupancy we have, that's the issue that if I put insulation or double glazing or whatever in my house, it has a 10-year payback, but I might leave, I might, I, might, uh, I might sell the house in five. You know, will I ever get it back? And as, you, as you're probably aware, I think it's is it AB 811 or AB 1811, AB 811, you know, is, is trying to address that precise problem by putting, being able to put these investments um, into, effectively into the property tax so it would stay with the property. Um, awareness and education. Sometimes I think this is a little, bit like the, a little bit like the top one. The real reason that a consumer 
uh, you know, seems to apply a high discount rate is that he's not sure he's going to get it, right? It's a sort of, it's sort of uncertainty. So if you can remove the uncertainty, then I think actually what you'd see is, is, the, is the, the discount. The, these two would sort of behave in, in, in tandem. Um, there are some quality perceptions. There are still people who worry about the quality of light, stuff like that. And then availability, this is, this is actually quite, um, uh, I've come across this just recently that our, our um, uh, central heating, oh, not a central heating, our hot water boiler is kind of playing up at the moment. The problem here is, is, is um, it can be literally that, you know, if, you're, if your furnace goes out or your central heating boiler goes out or whatever, you need a new one quickly, and you basically end up buying whatever one the, you know, the contractor has on the back of his truck, right? Um, and if he doesn't have the, the, the efficient one, you know, then you just locked it in for another 25 years. Um, and so these are all, um, you know, this can be, a, this could be uh, addressed through standards, obviously, and this was a, you know, the, you know, your light bulb goes out, you have to go down to 7-Eleven, they don't have a CFL. Well, we've fixed that problem, right? Because <laughs> um, they won't be able to sell anything but CFLs. But um, these are, you know, ultimately the sort of barriers. So just to close, you know, there's this, just this colossal market, $150 billion. It needs some, uh, in, you know, the, the uh, stimulus package has actually helped quite a bit um, in, in getting some of the, uh, some of the sort of low-tech stuff moving. Um, and, you know, with, if we can remove these barriers, this market could, it could really take off effectively, uh, effectively tripling in size from what it is today.